I mentioned in another video that Augustine truly deserves the word, the name genius attached to his name. He sat on the hinge between the ancient world and the medieval world. He profoundly influenced medieval theology, and he was the hero of people like Luther and Calvin in the Protestant Reformation, uh, just on the, because of the scope of his intellect and his influence. And so we look forward to taking a look at uh, his spiritual autobiography, uh, which is called Confessions. Confessions, like the word apology, has two meanings. It can mean um, the confession of sins and forgiveness, or it can mean a statement of your faith, like the Westminster Confession of Faith. So the words apology and the word confessions have these dual meanings. And this book is actually Augustine's spiritual autobiography. Um, it is the story of, of really all of us. We read his life. But if you're like me, you can begin to see parallels between observations he makes about his own life and my life. It is a story of everyone who has journeyed from worldliness and ambition and despair to salvation and joy by the grace of God. So there are several characteristics that I want to point out really quickly that we find in confession. The first is Augustine is straightforward, honest. He... Uh, many biographies from the ancient world, they talk about their victories, but never their defeats. They talk about how great they are, or how great the emperor is, but they never really share the bad news. Particularly if I wrote my own book, I would share, I put my best foot forward, but Augustine is very honest about what happened that before Christ and what led him to Christ. He has the courage to describe his empty pursuits, um, trying to find rest in God. Um, he takes a pretty circuitous route, uh, much like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is vanity um, until he finds his final rest in God. Um, it's interesting, too, he shows a, a unique spiritual understanding that some of his observations, we'll, we'll look at some of his quotes just as an example. He has keen psychological insight, um, which means I think he understands the nature of man better than many modern scholars. Um, we'll compare in a minute Augustine to Freud, and you'll see what I mean. And then um, in Confessions, you'll be reading along and suddenly he'll just stop and praise God. Thank you, God, for this difficulty, this problem, this victory. I know that it was all being woven together to you, woven together by you to lead me to your throne, to bring me back to the family of God. And so all along the way, there is honesty about his own sins, but gratefulness to God for what God was doing even in the midst of that unsaved time because God was then still leading, molding, shaping to bring him to the throne of God, to bring him to conversion, to begin to use his life as the profound influence on Western civilization that Augustine becomes. So I mentioned one of the characteristics of the Confessions is his straightforward honesty. I mean, if you were trying to put your best foot forward, would you say something like this? My sin was all the more incurable because I imagined that I was not a sinner. Do you see what he's saying? Before Christ, he, he thought that he had standing. He thought that he had influence. And all the while he's sinning, but he assumes he's not a sinner. It's like a double sin. And then the one spot where he is contemplating his relationship with Monica, his mistress, uh, and... Uh, in other issues before he becomes a Christian, he prays, Lord, make me chaste, make me pure, but not yet. Um, and all of us have felt that double pull at one time or another in temptation. So this is his straightforward honesty. He also, like Solomon, 
describes his emptiness. So all the time he's studying rhetoric, all the time he's studying the ancient books, he's still f not finding in them real satisfaction for his soul. He says this, I was obliged to memorize the wanderings of a hero named Aeneas, while in the meantime I failed to remember my own erratic ways. I learned to lament the death of Dido, who killed herself for love, while all the time, in the midst of these things, I was dying, separated from you, my God, and my life, and I shed no tears for my own plight. You hear the honesty? But you feel the emptiness, too. He's, he's studying all kinds of things. He's learning a lot of intellectual information. He's loving the ancient world and the books, but they are not what his soul truly seeks. So he's like Solomon. He finds wealth and power and women and security, and God seems to be just emptying out the pleasure out of all of his sins so that he can see that it's empty, so that he can find his rest in God. So he has both a um, straightforward honesty and in his pursuit of what Solomon would call vanity, he has the courage to face the emptiness of life without Christ. Here are some of the examples of his spiritual understanding. These are just quotes, and I thought I'd read them because it'll give you a, a sense of his heart. All things, Lord, find in you their origin, their impulse, and the center of their being. You are unchangeable, God, and yet you change all things. Every soul that sins brings its own punishment upon itself. And this one, give grace to do as you ask, and ask whatever you will. This is a heart that wants to be so open to God that whatever God asks him to do, he wants to be ready and able to do. So he asks God for the grace, so that when God asks him to do a thing, he will have the grace to accomplish it there and ready. Do you see the poverty of his the, his sense of his own inability apart from the grace of God to do anything that would end up pleasing God. So that's his spiritual understanding. And then he has an interesting psychological insight. Here's my here's my challenge for you. In the modern world we'll read The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. And I remember the first time I read that book, I kept going, huh? Are you sure? I never felt that way. He describes the, the Oedipus complex, how everybody goes through a period in which every son wants to kill his father and sleep with his mother. And I'm looking at and I'm going, uh, he seems to be telling me about what's going on in his own head, but I never felt that way, and I doubt most people ever felt that way. You understand? So I'm reading Freud, and he's making these psychological insights, and I'm not sure <laughs> I agree. But i got to tell you, when I read Augustine, when he talks about uh, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God, when he talks about his, his wrestling with those sexual urges, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet, when he writes about how his pride blinded him and how in humility... God led him to begin begin to truly see. Uh, when I read about those things, now those things I recognize as impulses in my own heart, and I bet you do too. So what's cool is, <laughs> far earlier than Freud, we have somebody who has a willingness to look inside himself and to describe those things that will help us as well on our spiritual journey. Uh, and then I mentioned those times when in Confessions, Augustine just stops and worships God. And listen to some of the things that he says here. My soul is like a house, small for you to enter, but I pray you to enlarge it. It is in ruins, but I ask you to remake it. Oh, isn't that the burden of a, of a burning heart, a desire to know God more intimately? Lord, my house is so small, but you can make it bigger. My house is so torn down, but you can remake it. You see what we have? And then he says, There is no doubt in my mind, Lord, that I love you. I feel it with certainty. You struck my heart with your word, and I loved you. Passages are let in here all over the place in which he has to stop and thank God for this or that aspect of his life. <laughs> 
success and failure. And I got to tell you, I think the preponderance is on the failure side because at every turn, God is moving him slowly toward himself. If you just took the opening paragraph of the Confessions, here's what you would learn. That mankind is designed for worship that we bear in ourselves the marks of sin and death. Those marks ought to check our pride, our understanding of the world around us. We ought to approach where we are with a sense of humility. He says our, com com our contentment comes from our praise and worship of God, and that until we find God, restlessness haunts us. And so as long as we try to fill that spiritual vacuum um, with anything in our lives besides God, restlessness haunts us until we can finally find our rest in him. Here's the way that Confessions breaks out, just in closing. Books 1 through 9 are the story of his life before Christ, his conversion, his baptism, uh, the death of his mother, and a whole encomium encomium of praise for what God did in his mother. And then books 10 through 12 is his interpretation of Genesis 1 with reflections on the nature of man. So he turns from biography uh, more to a discussion of what Genesis 1 has to teach. So I think you're going to like the book. Um, feel free to dive in and uh, let me know what you think. Thanks for listening.